This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. In the name of God, source of all being, incarnate word, and Holy Spirit. So the Gospel tells us today that we are salt and light. Not someday you will be, but you are salt and light. Rather apt images, considering we are in a very vibrant, exciting time in the life of the parish. We have a search committee that just got commissioned. We had an annual meeting. We had a vestry retreat. We have a vestry leadership. All thing, all kinds of things are going on. It's time to remind Mind ourselves who we are and what we are: salt and light. And all of this on top of some strange addendum about the law and not abolishing the law but fulfilling it. And what has that got to do with salt and light? <laughs> well, salt. Salt gets a bad rap. Um, you know, our doctors have all these bad things to say about salt. I, I, apparently my doctor doesn't drink margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> but salt... It's basically a good thing, despite some medical issues. For one thing, salt, until refrigeration, was the way we preserve food and meat. Uh, an amazing thing, salt does. Salt flavors things. It makes things taste good. It gives us, or is part of the electrolytes that our body needs physiologically. About eight years ago, the one time I hiked into the Grand Canyon, I remember as we were getting ready to go down the trail, the leader said, now all you folks on salt-free diets or low-sodium diets, listen up. That doesn't count today. You're going to be sweating and working and huffing and puffing down the canyon, and it is critical that you have your electrolytes not compromised. And the trail wisdom today for big-time hiking is not just that you need to drink water, but you need salty snacks as well, and there's an actually a medical condition that can kick in if you don't have enough salty snacks or salt in your diet when you're exercising. And interestingly enough, in some parts of the world, especially in Asia, uh, one of the symbols of hospitality and welcome is bread and salt. And that's presented to someone as a welcome gift. So salt deserves a better reputation than it gets. I think what Jesus is saying in this image is that he expects and wants his people, like you, me, to taste good. He wants us to taste good. Have you ever met a Christian or a religious person who has absolutely no sense of humor whatsoever? <laughs> they don't taste good. <laughs> Have you ever met a religious person or a Christian who is so certain, so absolutely certain about what they believe, about a whole bunch of non-salvation you know, non stuff, they're so certain that there's just no room to talk about it or dialogue or ask questions or discuss? Folks like that don't taste good. They've lost their saltiness. That doesn't mean you don't have convictions and beliefs, but it's how you carry them. Angels fly because they travel light. <laughs> well, I think we're called to be winsome, to be attractive. That doesn't mean you give up what you believe or your convictions, but in such a way that people might want to talk to you. It's like the vagabond who was traveling across the moors of England and he'd been walking all day, tired and hungry, went through this little village, and there at the end of the village was this fairly large building, several stories. <clears throat> it looked like a pub or an inn of some sort, and it was called George and the Dragon. George and the Dragon. <sighs> well, he knocked on the door, and he knocked on the door, and finally the window on the next floor up opened up, and this grumpy voice came out and said, What do you want? What do you want? Well, sir, you suppose you have some victuals, some food? Been traveling all day. Very, we're very, very hungry. And the guy says, "Go away. We don't want you around here. Get out of here." Slam the window shut. Knocked on the door again. Window opens. 
I told you to get away from here. Get out of here. Sir, you, is there at least a room we can rent? We're really tired. There's nothing else in town. Could we? No. We don't want you around here. Get out of here. Quit bothering me. Slams the window shut. Knocks on the door again. Sir, would you, not, would you please reconsider? Uh, we're, we're desperate. There's nothing else in town. We're, we're hungry. We're tired. And we, we've got to stop. I said, get out of here. We don't want you around here. Shut up and go away. Slams the window shut. Knocks on the win door again. Window opens up. What do you want? I told you to go away. Well, do you suppose, sir, that I could speak to George? <laughs> the gentleman on the next floor was very unsalty. <laughs> then Jesus says we are light. Light is an apt and common image, <clears throat> perhaps more than salt. It's the season of epiphany, the season of light, the light that, that shines out of the crib to the, to the magi, to us, to the world, a light to lighten all nations. Last Sunday was Candle Mass, or the Feast of the Presentation of Christ. We read the Nunc Dimittis of Simeon, the light that shines to the whole world from Christ. And even to the fourth century, we have descriptions of the candle mass procession. Fourth century, when Christians carried candles in procession into the church or the nave as part of that feast. <coughs> and in the early church, baptism was understood to be illumination. Now, we joke about people if they got the light. But, it's, but it, that's a very serious image. To be baptized was to be illuminated, to have been given the light that now you shine out yourself. Light is very important. Light helps us to see everything. Without light, you can't see. Light gives us colors. Without light, all you have is nothing. You need light to bring out the, all the, the colors in the spectrum. Light gives warmth, whether it's a physical or a mental warmth like the dawn of a beautiful morning on a cold winter day, or the warmth of a campfire or a fireplace. And there's, and there's nothing like warming things up with just a really good, nice smile. On a grumpy day, sometimes we can really use a smile from somebody, and that's an experience of warmth. And light is required to navigate. The light we're talking about, of course, is not something that generates from us, we're like the moon. We reflect light that comes from elsewhere. The moon reflects the light of the sun, so our job is to reflect the light of Christ. No more, no less. And that means if we are the light, as Jesus says, that means when people come here to us or experience us, especially as a community, they should see God. They should see God. Because that's what we are, light. The vehicles of the light that the world so desperately needs. You may not have noticed lately, but the world is very dark sometimes. Our country right now is very dark. Light is desperately needed, and our job is to make sure it gets out there and can be seen. That's our mission as disciples. You need light in order to see where you're going and how to see the end. Like the country vicar who went to the squires for dinner, and he picked up his lantern and walked over to the vicar's, uh, the squire's house on the other side of the village. They had a very lovely evening imbibing from the squire's rather abundant wine cellar. They uh, enjoyed many variations in that wine cellar. By the time the evening was drawing to a close, they were well oiled. And um, eventually it was time to go home and the vicar picked up his lantern and he had an awful time navigating getting home. He didn't exactly know why. Somehow he managed to make it, maybe because of the street lamps, and he made it, and the next morning he got a message from the squire that went, Vicar, if you would be so kind as to return my parrot in the cage, I'll return your lantern. <laughs> Without light, we're going to trip. Well, all of this sits on top of a strange part of the gospel about law. Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And I know there's a notion out there, perhaps, well, isn't the Old Testament sort of 
out now. You know, the New Testament came. The Old Testament's gone. It's a whole new ball game. That's kind of a misunderstanding that's often around. Uh, there are, I meet Christians on occasion who, I don't like the Old Testament. Well, they haven't read it, probably, or at least all of it. There was even a notion in the early days of the church, uh, Marcion's canon. Marcion was a fellow who advocated that we dump the whole Old Testament and just have parts of the New Testament because he didn't like the Old Testament. thought that was a different God. Well, that was condemned. But there is that notion, and Jesus is saying, no, I'm not throwing anything out, but it's time to go deeper and to get at what it's really all about, what the law really is. Law is not something bad. In fact, to Jewish people, the law was a great gift that God cared enough to enter into this relationship defined by this law or Torah. I had a friend named Don who was a policeman. And uh, Don was, and it's relevant to the story because it's true, Don was extremely conservative. In fact, so much so that eventually he left our church and there was a bit of a strain in our relationship for a while because of the way he left. But I still cherish him as a very dear friend who has gone on ahead. And I remember Don, the conservative cop, once said to me, you can keep the letter of the law so rigid that you lose the spirit. That was from a conservative cop. And I think that's what Jesus is maybe talking about here. You can do all the right things. You can obey the law and not have a clue as to what it's all about. Now, he uses the example, for, for example, of thou shalt not commit adultery. You've heard that said. It's in the Old Testament. Don't commit adultery. Well, that means a lot more, as Jesus interprets it, than just don't have any affairs, uh, because you can be so rigid about not committing adultery and still not do very well with fidelity. It's about fulfillment and joy and love and commitment and compassion and the depth of real relationship, not just, you know, checking the boxes. You may recall that uh, Jimmy Carter, who was one of the politicians who actually does know something about the Bible, he's still teaching Sunday school, had a little problem with that because he was misinterpreted naturally by saying, you know, he'd never committed adultery, but he'd done it in his heart. And that's the point. It's deeper than just obeying the law. You can still miss the point. Or take the example of uh, speed laws. If there's a sign out there in the street that says, you know, 55 miles an hour, the point of that isn't what's on your odometer or what's under your dashboard. The point of that is that you are not supposed to drive so fast that you kill somebody. That's the point, not the law. That's the point. A, a formula that helps me, and maybe it helps you, is to look upon this like a, it's like a mathematical proportion for those of you who did well in math. It wasn't me. <laughs> law is to acts or actions, equal sign, as the gospel is to persons. In other words, the law deals with actions and behaviors, yes, but the gospel that Jesus is talking about is dealing with real human beings who have to live real lives in real complicated worlds. It's a kind of a different perspective. And so when I look back at the traffic law stuff, if you've recently renewed your license, you know that there's the California basic speed law, or at least there used to be. The Cal Calif well, I'm not sure it does exist anymore. The California basic speed law said that even though the sign says 70 miles an hour, which is the law, if it's raining and foggy and ice on the street, you are to slow down and drive at a safe speed. And you can be ticketed even though technically you were obeying the law going 70 because it wasn't safe. Well, for us Christians, our basic speed law is we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and our neighbors as ourselves. That's our basic speed law. That's our law. And all the rest is a flow from that. So I think to be salt and to be light is the best way to keep the law. St. Augustine, probably the greatest theologian in the Western Church for a thousand years at least, a mighty theologian once said, quote, love God and do anything you want. 
Now, there are those Christians who hear that and immediately call 911 and want medication. <laughs> but if you hear what he's saying, love God and do whatever you want. And that's what Jesus understands the law to be about. If we love God, that will probably or should affect how we behave. And so Jesus is calling us to be salty, to be tasting good, to be attractive and winsome, so that light can shine through us to those who are experiencing, whether it's darkness in the world or in the news or in their own personal lives, they need to see light coming through us. And if we are salt and light, then I'm pretty certain I'm pretty certain that most of the time, I think we'll probably do what God wants us to do. Amen.